It goes down smooth as cognac, which like everybody is drinking in the story to excess. Better than food. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I'm your host, Clifford Lee Sargent. Great to see you as always. Hope you're doing well. Get that coffee. All right. Today is the American author James Baldwin's Giovanni's Room, published in 1956. Beautiful book. A dark confessional romantic tragedy. It's a love story about a man who cannot love. This was a recommendation from Josh. Thanks a bunch, man. He suggested I actually uh, review it for Valentine's Day, which was a great idea, but unfortunately it got pushed back a little bit, so. Here we are. Nevertheless, thanks man. While this book is normally placed in the gay fiction category or LGBT or whatever, Baldwin himself said that it's, it's, it's not really about homosexuality. And perhaps some would argue otherwise and there's merit in that. I mean, there's a component, surely. But I think what he meant was, that's not the central conflict of the story, right? Of the characters. It's just their reality. It's just who they are. The characters happen to be gay. And you know, being written in the 50s, that was a, that was a, a time, of course, when it was legitimately dangerous to be gay, uh, though not illegal in France. The real conflict of the story is the main character's inability to love other people. And the shame of being gay is a big element, uh, a big driver for the protagonist, and, and it can be argued is the main reason why he behaves the way he behaves, and how that, of course, completely destroys everything. So no happy endings here. What's new? Now you'd think that a character of that description would invoke antipathy from the very first sentence, but actually uh, it's not the case, uh, not at all. Quite the opposite, for me at least. We're really curious about this articulate fellow who's uh, very, you know, his tone is kind of mournful and tired. Quite literally mournful, you know, his previous lover Giovanni has been sentenced to death, we discover. And it could be argued even that he's partially responsible. The entire tale is related during a moment of introspection by David. An American expat running away from what he thinks is just America, but what he discovers is actually himself. In the beginning of the book, everything has already occurred, and we discover that he's uh, staying in a rented house in the south of France, brooding, basically, drinking a lot. Uh, something terrible has happened, or is about to happen, and we learn it's both. And he narrates to us the story of his life in, in the form of a reflective confession. But really quick, today's episode is sponsored by The Ridge Wallet. These things are awesome. They are light, sleek, industrial, beautiful little pieces of minimalist modern design to simplify your life. And I feel like a lot of our lives could use some simplifying right now. Holds up to 12 cards plus room for cash on the back. It's got a cash clip here. They have ones with a strap as well. I prefer the one with the clip. They're great for travel, for taking to the gym. They're fashionable. It's designed to easily fit into your front pocket. So now you've freed up some pocket space. Please do not put it in your back pocket. These are not meant to be sat on. This is the aluminum navy model. This one here is my normal go-to, the matte black titanium. I've had it for over a year and it has served me very well. The durable material means that each wallet comes with a lifetime warranty. You can buy this one wallet and carry it for life. In fact, the Rich Team is so confident you'll like it, they'll let you test drive it for 45 days. You can send it back for a full refund if you don't love it. So no worries there. And if this hasn't convinced you yet, check out their 40,000 five-star reviews. 40,000. Get 10% off today with free worldwide shipping and returns by going to rich.com forward slash better than food and using the discount code better than food. The link is below. Thanks a bunch. So yeah, David's an American guy in his late 20s, hanging around drinking too much in 1950s Paris, while his fiance is off in Spain, kind of trying to figure things out. Taking a break from him by the sounds of it, he seems indecisive. Basically something's off, we feel, as soon as we uh, hear the story. Something's off and she can sense it. And there's, there's definitely something off with David. His secret, shameful to him, is that he is sexually attracted to men. Being gay is not illegal per se in France at the time. I think just heavily frowned upon. And this also, you know, and I, I, don't, I don't think I really realized this, it's shocking to think about, is still a time when execution by guillotine is still legal in France and practiced. Went till 1977, believe it or not. Not publicly, that, that ended in the 30s. But to think that it went until the 30s with public executions by guillotine is insane. So meanwhile, David's exploring Paris and he tells us how he came to meet Giovanni. It was when he was low on cash and so he was taking advantage of a certain friend of his, a kind of a middle-aged dandyish guy named Jacques. A middle-aged gay friend of his who's always on the hunt for young boys. And uh, they frequent this bar called Guillaume's. And it seems like, you know, a gay bar. And one day they discover a new bartender is there, a handsome young Italian guy. And he and David hit it off immediately. The bartender's name is Giovanni. Giovanni lives on the outskirts of Paris, far from the, the nice parts in a small, cramped, and filthy room that eventually he and David share. 
And this room comes to, to represent many things. It's the overarching metaphor uh, for the whole book, for this whole secret part of David's life. It's where all of David's shame hides. But for a brief period, for a while, it's as though it represents miraculous respite from the cold outside world of putting on faces, of, of lying. As he's been lying all his life, he, he had a relationship with one young man much earlier, but uh, that did not last because David got scared and then treated him badly. As this Guardian article I've linked to below says, one of the major themes of the novel is shame. It's very interesting. I don't know if David's all bad. I don't, I don't know if he, uh, you know, it's like he gives a fuck about what some people think, but he doesn't give a fuck about what other people think. The people who he doesn't give a fuck what they think, those are the people he should really be loving. David's a man who is more concerned with keeping appearances than telling the truth to himself and others. And the sad thing is I think that's, that's all of us to some degree, which is probably why we can empathize with him. And so of course the relationship with Giovanni, as beautiful as it is, or as beautiful as it's written about, uh, can't last, uh, David being the way he is. So we learn how it all falls apart. Any of us could have guessed that and the tone of the novel almost immediately gives it away. There is a kind of, you know, tone of sophisticated tragedy to the writing of Baldwin in this one. This is the second Baldwin I've read. I've only read a, um, Going to Meet the Man in this one. It's beautiful, but in kind of a Hitchcock manner, wherein just below the surface of beautiful writing lies something dangerous or sinister. There's this, um, this kind of a threat or dread that's omnipresent in the book. Reminds me a bit of Georges Simenon, even better writing in its lusciousness. And that voice going on and on like a razor blade on glass is a line from the book. Beautiful line. Baldwin manages to make what in society's eyes at the time they'd call depravity look sophisticated, free, joyful, fun, real. You know, it, it feels like a real relationship and it feels like a real destruction of a relationship. It feels like real love. One of the things I most loved about the book was how Baldwin, using so few words, I mean the book is, is less than 200 pages, really developed and displayed the intricate psychology of all of the main characters. David, Hella, uh, David's fiance, Giovanni, and even Jacques. When things go as they do, we can really get a sense of everybody's motivations, you know, their secrets, their desires, uh, you know, the, the reasons why they do what they do. They're all so fleshed out, you almost feel as if you're watching the film instead of reading the book but not in the manner where the writing is cheap, but in the manner that it flows, effortlessly. Even Jacques you gained a little bit of sympathy for. This guy is doomed. A word in the novel used by Giovanni. I think he says, Americans have no sense of doom. Doomed to desire these young men that he keeps chasing after. And in a very ominous scene, Jacques tells David, you ought to have some apprehension that the man you see before you was once even younger than you are now and arrived at his present wretchedness by imperceptible degrees. Because, uh, you know, David thinks that Jacques is pretty pathetic chasing after these young boys. But, you know, Jacques is like, you're going to get there yourself. You know, you just wait and you won't even know it. But Jacques' comment is much more than that too. It really struck me because it's not just, it's not just in the context of old gay men lusting after young boys. It's aging. Uh, it's all of us. It's a reminder that age is coming. It's here. It's arriving right now. And suddenly you wake up one day and find yourself older and kind of a stranger to yourself, not at all who you once were. Irreparably changed and unable to fit into the same mold. But we often don't perceive it for a long time. The book is a good reminder as well that it was, it was really legitimately dangerous to be gay in the 20th century. Being gay in this time and place uh, really seems to have been, in a way, a curse. Something one can never escape, but nevertheless such, such a uh, huge component of oneself. As a method of survival, it seems that one was required to hide. If you're thinking along the themes of uh, French, gay, and prison, then one of course can't help but think of the French author Jean Genet. And there's actually a moment in the book where David remembers meeting a writer who was in prison and famous for it. And the description is very much of Genet, it seems, who Baldwin actually did know. James Baldwin was an American author and activist who is often associated with civil rights. He was an excellent public speaker, had a very commanding, powerful voice and tone. Very active in civil rights, yeah, highly influential. Legendary, an extraordinary and very courageous individual. He was a friend of both Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. What's interesting about this book is that Baldwin actually wrote this story about a gay white man. And I've read that there's actually only one other piece of Baldwin's fiction that features a white protagonist or, or you know, white character. Uh, and it's a very short story. I think Baldwin himself said that at this time in history, he couldn't, um, he couldn't tackle the problem of homosexuality and race in the same story. Like it was just, it was just too much. 
audiences couldn't handle it. The, the first one was semi-autobiographical, Go Tell It on the Mountain, which I need to, I need to read. This was his second book, and he was actually criticized by his publisher, Knopf. They said that if they published this one, he was going to alienate his black audience. And I believe specifically because of this book, as I understand it, according to Wikipedia, he was considered not black enough by civil rights leaders and was called subversive by some of them. So this novel really made some waves, and I think Baldwin kind of got shot on both sides with this one. But this novel is so good. I mean, it seems that it eventually just got through to people and got the respect that it deserved. It's a brilliant novel. It's a novel about youth and beauty and the impossibility of certain relationships, of certain beautiful moments, whether due to time, place, circumstance, or in this case, inner self-conflict. All these factors can destroy love in the most tragic way, where some die, actually die, but others are dead, but still living, so to speak. It's a gorgeous book. It, it seems like it would be great to read aloud, and I've actually linked to a clip of Baldwin reading it aloud below. Moves along like a sailboat cutting through the blue ocean on a bright, beautiful day. Flowing in the wind. Goes down smooth as cognac, which, like, everybody is drinking in the story to excess. And of course, who's gonna balk at the setting? I mean, like, Paris in the south of France in the 1950s? I mean, are you kidding? Like, you couldn't choose a more desirable location to read about, in my opinion. Baldwin himself lived and died in the south of France, actually. And the dark tone of the novel, again, reminded me of Georges Simenon's Act of Passion, which was actually in the, it was set in the same area. And it's also a novel about men and women, their differences and the confusions that occur in their relationships. It's a story about the desire for peace and stability against the burning throes of passion and sexual desire, the sometimes impossibility of their coalescence and their mutual exclusion. This is a passage about the room itself. The significance is that this place represents the one period in the book where David is sincere, the only time when he really loves someone else and when he's free. But it's only for a moment, because then his mind torments him again and leads him to do what he does. I scarcely know how to describe that room. It became, in a way, every room I had ever been in, and every room I find myself in hereafter will remind me of Giovanni's room. I did not really stay there very long. We met before the spring began and I left there during the summer, but it still seems to me that I spent a lifetime there. Life in that room seemed to be occurring underwater, as I say, and it is certain that I underwent a sea change there. I think sea change is a Shakespearean reference, meaning an experience. I think it's from The Tempest. I haven't read it yet. They're actually putting it on this year at the uh, Ashland, Oregon Shakespeare Festival. I'm thinking about going. I might check that out. I love Ashland, Oregon. That's a beautiful, beautiful town. So what I dislike about it? Nothing about the writing. I think uh, Giovanni's crime, actually. I thought Giovanni's crime would be much more... I don't know, grandiose and what it turned out to be. Perfectly understandable what he does as well, I should add. And also, disturbingly, the media's reaction and depiction of him was perfectly understandable as well. All for the worse. So you should read it. Well, of course, if you're a Baldwin fan, it's essential. But yeah, I'd also say if you're a fan of uh, Yukio Mishima, Albert Camus, and uh, yeah, Georges Simenon. If you liked Simenon, I think, uh, I think you ought to check this out. And I'd also like to say to those viewers who are younger, you know, in their 20s or so, Something about the cliches that are told to you in life. I'm not here to teach you anything, it just applies more to you than those my age. Many of these cliches that people tell you about life are bullshit and nobody really knows anything. But the one thing that is true, I've discovered, is the sickening speed with which time runs away from all of us and it gets worse as you get older. Perhaps you've even experienced it in the course of this pandemic. Time doesn't wait for you. You're older, I'm older. After two years inside a room, not unlike a prison sometimes. In the scheme of things, you really don't have any time and neither do I. So what I mean to say is if love opens the door and it's real, God help you if you walk the other way without even stepping inside for a moment. Put another way, if you somehow find your way into Giovanni's room, you are living. Actually living. Don't fuck it up. And if you do, say you're sorry. And this isn't just for folks who swing a certain way, this is for everyone. Better than food. Loved it. Absolutely. Gorgeous writing. Coffee time. For those of you who are new, thank you very much for watching. I take all the names of the patrons on Patreon who have donated $5 or more per video to the show. I place their names in this mason jar, and for every review I do, I pull out a name, and whoever's name I pull out shall be sent a hard copy of the book, plus a bag of coffee, roasted by yours truly. And the coffee is delicious. If you would like to get in on that and help support the show, please check out the information below. Thank you very much. There's also more information below on the various perks you get for signing up on each tier on Patreon. Also, another great way to support the show would be to check out our bookstore on Instagram. Link below. Thanks a bunch. Unfortunately, international shipping is not included. Sorry about that. Thank you very much to all the patrons and best of luck. Okay, here we go. David. David E. Thank you very much, David. I sincerely appreciate it. You're going to receive 
James Baldwin's Giovanni's Room plus a bag of delicious coffee. And I hope you love both. And I think you will. David's a friend. He's got good taste. Cool. All right, well, that's all I've got for you today. Thank you very much for watching. Please subscribe if you haven't already and hit the thumbs up if you enjoyed this. It really does help with the algorithm. And always remember, bring a book wherever you go. All right, take care of yourselves. Have a great night. And I'll talk to you soon. Ciao.